Well, welcome back to our next session. Uh, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce the speaker, Jamie Fobert, who is an architect who has made and continues to make an enormous impact on buildings for viewing and for presenting art. Based in London, he has designed a large extension to the Tate's outpost in St Ives, a totemic location for British art and artists, and also to the wonderfully quirky and enjoyable Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, and is now working on a major project for the National Portrait Gallery in central London. So, Jamie, over to you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I have uh, a tremendous number of slides to fly through in uh, 30 minutes, but I will do my best. Um, what I thought today we would do is um, try to take you on a journey that the office has been on for the last 20 years. And I think it's really important to go back to the beginning and to think about um, the small projects in art and the way we were first introduced to working in art, and then to begin to talk um, about how these took us through to our competition winning projects for Tate St. Ives. I thought we should focus on that. Um, and then also give you a very brief insight uh, into the work that's underway at the National Portrait Gallery in London. Um, and so when I say from small beginnings, I very much mean small. And these were projects that we, we did uh, as, the, as the office just set up. And we were very fortunate to work with uh, uh, domestic spaces, but for artists. I mean, and these were great artists. So we, we worked on the, the house of Anthony Gormley and Vicken Parsons, the sculptor and painter uh, in North London. This is the room we built for them. The, the painters, Christopher Lebrun and Charlotte Verite, um, adding a small extension onto their house. Um, and the photographer, uh, Nadav Kander, uh, and his wife, Nicola. I, I think what's important about these projects is that working with artists, you, they have a very different perspective on what they're looking for, what they're thinking about. They're very concerned with uh, form and light and color, all the things that they are interested in their work, they, they want to discuss with you. So you start to develop a way of speaking, a way of thinking, which I think is very distinct from, say, working with developers or working with uh, regular human beings. Working with artists is always a very specific thing. Um, and through this, we began to work with existing galleries um, on exhibitions. And this meant that we started to work with curators and, and understand how galleries work. And these, we've done at least 20 or, or different exhibitions from classic exhibitions, like from Constable de Delacroix at Tate Britain, um, picking, basically picking paint colors and building some partitions and thinking about the way visitors move through the space, but also watching the way curators work, the way they uh, hang works, the, the, the concerns they have about the way um, people move through and see the work. And then more, uh, at the V&A, uh, a work about contemporary craft where we built plaster, plaster walls out of blocks of cast plaster, thinking about what is a neutral materiality that would then best help uh, make the experience of the visitor amplified. Um, but always the important thing is that the work that we do in exhibition never overpowers the experience of the artwork. I mean, we came very close to overpowering the artwork in this. Um, really wonderful uh, experience of working with the artist and filmmaker Patrick Keeler in Tate Britain, where he assembled um, a, a huge number of works uh, spanning centuries um, to tell a story about politics and e economics in the British Isles uh, for the past 200 years. And we, we assembled these all on mill finished aluminium frames. Um, but the, the time that we were really introduced to the, the team at Tate in London was doing a project on freestanding sculpture in the 20th century called the Upright Figure, where we installed in the turbine hall um, black steel um, plates and walls on which sculpture spanning 1900 to 2000 could be placed to tell the story of the way um, European artists have reinterpreted the human figure. And it needed to be quite uh, 
it needed to be to allow the curators the ability to move and change sculptures over the year it was in place, but also to create a context, a second context within the vast um, hall of the Turbine Hall. Um, and so from these works, we began to work on temporary art spaces. And, and again, this is shifting from working on exhibition to actually working on the spaces. And for a few years, we did the Freeze Art Fair, which is a monumental art fair in central London. And, uh, but here we started to think about how do you enter the space? We, in this particular iteration, we you came up a temporary ramp and entered high above the whole fair and looked over it. And we also introduced to Freeze a series of public open spaces like squares, the tree that you see in this image, we actually rented and put into the space because the fair is in Regent's Park and it felt very right that you should see more trees. Um, and then we had a really wonderful experience working in Moscow. This is the Melnikov bus garage from 1926. Uh, and it had been saved from demolition and renovated uh, in Moscow. This is the, the site, but it is an extraordinary uh, interior, um, 8,000 square meters. It's vast. It's a couple of football pitches. And it's um, Konstantin uh, Melnikov's, uh, one of his great um, buildings. And this was taken by the Center for Contemporary Art, which then became called the Garage after this building name. And we did, a, for five years, we did a series of exhibitions for them different ones. This is a Dan Flavin, um, which had actually only ever been shown in its full size in the garage because we had so much space. And then we did a series of exhibitions. This is um, young Russian artists. And, and they, they ran these exhibitions for four or five years in a short lease that they had for the building before going on to build a temporary building elsewhere. So um, we began then working on permanent art spaces, and we've done a few galleries in London. Our very first was the Pace Gallery in London, and this is the first Pace that we did. It was a very small space in Lexington Street, um, um, but it was create, taking up an existing space and creating gallery space with them. So this is, again, a shift uh, towards working with commercial galleries, understanding their needs, the way they change exhibitions. And so there's a kind of evolving understanding, first of artists themselves, then of curators, and then of galleries and how galleries operate, and then actually starting to design galleries themselves. And we, the first competition that we entered in one was for Kettle's Yard in Cambridge in the UK, uh, which is a really wonderful um, uh, place. Uh, people in London and, and in England love it very much. In, in the 1950s, uh, Jim Ede uh, was uh, a collector. He had been a curator at Tate, and he purchased these two derelict cottages that were slated for um, demolition, and he restored them. And the, this is an image of them from outside. He restored them, and he filled them with um, contemporary art, but also old furniture, um, bits of, of natural objects. Uh, quite an extraordinary collection. He lived in the house and every afternoon he and his wife would open their doors and allow Cambridge students to come in and talk about art and look at art. And um, he did this for about 20 years. You can see in the top right-hand corner are these two small cottages. But in 1968, he made an agreement to uh, give the houses and the collection to Cambridge University but his collection was vast compared to the tiny cottages. So they hired the great architect, Leslie Martin and David Owers to extend and talk about an extension. This is the cottages and this is the extension. Um, and it's really a masterpiece of uh, late mid-century architecture, 1970, David Owers and Leslie Martin. Uh, this is uh, a wonderful, uh, hand-drawn sectional perspective that we found in their ar of the archives showing the way Kettle's Yard operates. It's, it's above ground, but it only uses top light. It never has any windows. It's all about bringing light through these extraordinary uh, roof lights down into the space. And this is a view inside. 
again, it's a very contemporary building for its time, yet it's filled with uh, historic furniture. This is, in the foreground is a Barbara Hepworth, on the walls are Alfred Wallace's. It always feels very domestic. In fact, he called this, uh, instead of calling it the gallery, he called it the house. Um, what followed this first edition was that small pockets of land became available and a number of occasions through the 80s, it happened piecemeal. And I think when we arrived and for the competition, what was really evident is that these small additions that had happened after 1970 were much less successful, um, mainly because the land was very hard to get a hold of. Uh, and so we realized that there's a kind of line of significance between the cottages in the Leslie Martin house and all of the work that had happened after. And so we redesigned the site, keeping the house and the cottages, but creating two new galleries and really reconfiguring almost everything from the house to the facade. And here you can see an image on site and the extent to which uh, we demolished uh, all of these elements in order to come to rebuild and very, just without showing much, the, the facade in a very sensitive historic uh, uh, area kept the historic facade, but we added this element on the side, um, which is really, a very modest um, addition to the cityscape of Cambridge, um, but we created an, a new interior which really feels connected and con continuous with the existing Kettles Yard and brings you through a series of public spaces into two new galleries up a staircase uh, above, which is again, has the kind of feeling and language of the simplicity of Leslie Martin's work into really new contemporary galleries where they can show a lot of uh, contemporary work, which really works along with the house and the cottages as, as the changing elements of Kettle's Yard. So this competition, as well as, as one for Charleston in, uh, in East Sussex, brought us to a competition for Tate St. Ives. Uh, which was again uh, quite an important moment in, I think, uh, the work of the practice. So for those of you who uh, are not familiar, um, St. Ives is on the Atlantic in, in Britain. And uh, here we have the whole of uh, the UK. And this uh, down at the far west is Cornwall. And if we zoom into Cornwall, at the west of Cornwall, we have St. Ives, as a, which is a promontory out into the Atlantic. And it's really quite an important aspect of why St. Ives became so important in, in Britain for painters. It, St. Ives is, is a, a town of, of 10,000 people, um, but it sits on the, the spit of sand with both the Atlantic on both sides. And because it's pointing out to the north, in the morning the sun reflects off one side and in the afternoon the sun reflects off the other. So you have this daylight which is coming in on both sides. And this attracted artists to come to St. Ives as soon as the railway was installed in the 1860s. Um, and then during the Second World War, a whole series of artists from London decamped and came to St. Ives. Uh, they occupied the fishing lofts of the town and they, they painted. These included um, painters who are very important in Britain, but not so well known around the world, like Ben Nicholson. Uh, his, he came with his then wife, Barbara Hepworth, while he returned to London. She remained in St. Ives and, and was really one of Britain's most important sculptors. Her work is, for instance, in front of the UN in New York. Uh, and then other painters continued, even and during the war, even Nan Gabo um, spent his war years in St. Ives. And then after the war, there's continued to be other great painters like Patrick Heron. So the site, um, there was already a Tate Gallery built in uh, St. Ives, and it was built on this industrial site, uh, the only bit of industry in St. Ives. Um, and it was built in 1993 by the architects Evans and Shalev. 
it's a piece of kind of gentle postmodernism uh, with lots of references to Charles Rennie Mackintosh and the arts and crafts. It's a very big building. Um, the bit above is an, a building, uh, apartment building built later, which kind of uh, was not helpful. Um, but it's it's quite a powerful, almost, um, very big presence in the town already. And when we announced that we were going to uh, double the size of the Tate, there was a, a real uh, negative on the town, a real fear that the uh, town would be overpowered by this building. And that became quite an important guiding feature in the way we, we moved forward with, with the Tate. So, and this is a view of the sort of most defining feature, which is this huge rotunda drum based on the gas cylinder that was once on the site, which was the entrance. It has a huge glass window that overlooks the sea. And again, when, when we came to do the project, the one thing they said they, they didn't need was any more views to the sea. They had enough of that already. So um, this is a view looking back and, and what we found there were social housing buildings that were in very bad condition on the site next to the Tate and that we were then given the upper half of that site. The lower half was used the funds provided by Tate to build new social housing with views of the sea for all of the sheltered uh, residents that had been in all of the buildings previously. And but because we were at the back of the site, you can see so we flipped around the existing Tate with its huge rotunda is on the right hand side. Next to it on the left is the social housing outlined in black. And then behind it is the site that we were given, uh, which spanned almost an equal distance as the Tate, but again across. The real difficulty was that between our site and the existing Tate was an overlap of only four meters. Um, <clears throat> and we really wanted to make that four meters um, evaporate, not become an issue. One of the things about the Tate is that as you journey up, you arrive in the rotunda, you have to climb two sets of stairs or take lifts, and you arrive at this rather small suite of rooms. And a lot of people found that quite disappointing. We had a site which was 12 meters higher, and if we uh, then ask people to climb a second flight of stairs and a second set of lifts to get to the gallery, it would make the visitor experience very difficult. So our proposal in the competition was to excavate the cliff to insert in the gap in between the old, the existing Tate and the new gallery, uh, a service building which had a large art lift or art handling everything, including a lobby, and then to build the biggest possible gallery we could on the site was a 500 square meter gallery. And you can see what this did was created uh, an enfilade between the existing galleries, a new lobby and the new gallery, which allowed the visitors to experience a single journey, which was uh, 87 meters long and connected the new gallery to the existing galleries very clearly. But in order to achieve this, um, we needed to excavate down 12 meters into the hillside, um, which is mostly shale, but had some very hard granite in it. Um, this is just a view of the size of the excavation and what it was like when the piling was complete and um, being down below. And basically where you see these workers are, this is the space in which you are when you're in the new gallery. Um, so here's the plan. And you can see that uh, the galleries have no walls, uh, have no windows in any of the walls. It's a very uh, contained space. Um, so what became really important was daylight. And as I said in the beginning, daylight was the reason that artists came to St. Ives in the first place. If I, you recall the light that reflects on both sides. And so it became very, it, it seemed to me to be really important that daylight became what this gallery was all about, because that's why artists are in St. Ives in the first place. And we worked really closely with uh, Henry Luker and Mark Nutley from Max Fordham, service engineers, to create the a kind of ideal daylight gallery. A lot of architects put skylights in galleries, and very soon the curators cover them over because direct sunlight is falling on the works of art. 
And so we worked with them from first principles. And what we, we created were, this shows four, but in the end six, very large uh, light chambers, which uh, capture the light. You can see they're, they're very big. They capture a lot of daylight, actually light from the south. This idea of north light, uh, it was contradicted by the Tate. They said, we don't want north light. North light's very blue. We want to capture south light and south light has a much warmer hue, but only, and then to, uh, to diffuse that light. So this is a computer rendering showing how the light enters the gallery. It hits uh, the concrete beams of the ceiling. It's, it's thrown down onto the ground and you can see the red and the, the dark bright, bright yellow is too intense to hang a painting in. But on the walls, you have this very soft glow of very low lux. And it's very important that uh, artworks are not exposed to direct sunlight, especially in national collections. And another way of viewing it is more natural. Here you can see the intensity of the light coming through the roof light and hitting the floor. Generally, in the middle of the room, we would only have sculpture, which would be all right in sun, but the walls are very diffuse. This is how Max Fordham studied it. Uh, we in the office created models. This is a view inside our model. And this is something we work with a lot. It's foam board, duct tape, very much rough and ready. We take it outside, we put it in a plastic bag and we photograph it. And really our photographs showed exactly the same. Intense light in the, in the, in the roof, a pool of bright light on the floor, a very soft, very controlled light on the walls. And each of these uh, were repeated six times to create the 500 square meter room, um, but with total flexibility. So you could have, this is the model showing the six roof lights. Uh, and then this is the section. So it's, we had a lot of available height, which was really great. So we created a 5.5 hanging wall. We then spanned it with a structure of concrete, which allowed us to have a single open span, and those are 1.2 meters high. And then the light chambers extend it much further so that when you're standing underneath the roof lights, you have a, a volume of over 10 meters high. And here's a view of the gallery when it opened, uh, and you can see four of the six roof lights, and the Tate were very wonderful. They, they opened with an exhibition of sculpture so that the gallery could be seen in its most open form. Um, and this is looking up into the roof lights. And there's one detail that I'd be really keen to share with you. And this actually grew out of working with models, the models that you saw. This is a section, a cross section through the roof lights as they sit on top of the beams. And of course, we started with the roof lights lining up with the beams. Um, and what we found in, when we photographed it was then the, the section that was underneath the roof light had a lot of daylight in it. But as soon as you weren't under the roof light, the space between the beams were very dark. And then just by accident, while we were um, photographing it, someone knocked the roof off slightly and the roof lights shifted. So we were working with these models. You can see the beams and the, the model of the roof line. And so they just shifted slightly. So you can see that it's two, of, two sections are open and two are half covered. So if I go back, you can see what we had and then the accidental shift. And what that accidental shift meant, did was that it meant that the two central sections had bright daylight, the parts that were had no were in the dark stayed the same, but the in-between elements had a kind of half light. And this made it much less like uh, bright boxes in a dark ceiling. And it really uh, is apparent in the gallery, this gentle shifting. And you can see it really clearly in this photograph. So here we have the full daylight under the roof light, but then here we have the half daylight and the second half, and then finally the space with no daylight. And this softened everything. And honestly, this we would never have come to this conclusion except that we work with physical models and not just computer modeling. Um, it's really important 
part of the practice to, to make physical models, large scale physical models and experience those models in the present rather than on a screen. So another principle that was very important was flexibility. So this is the cross section of the whole project with two sections, but we ran a central beam down the center, um, which allowed uh, temporary walls to be placed. And then again, if this is the, the gallery empty with the six roof lights, we then allowed walls to be built to create six absolutely separate chambers. And all of the walls in this drawing have very controlled, very gentle daylight. So we knew these are the zones you could build walls, but that meant that we, the gallery could build, for instance, two small rooms and a large, uh, a series of enfilade galleries, uh, one long gallery with three small, um, uh, more clever open ways. In fact, the curators came back with this configuration, which we'd never drawn, which worked incredibly well. And that was the second exhibition that they did, which I'll show you. And so it's been a real pleasure over the last four years watching the way the curators have used the space. So for the opening, it was a single open space. One of the, the third show was a, um, a Patrick Heron show where they built the, the wall configuration I've just shown you with uh, this sort of um, asymmetrical layout. But then they have gone on, this is another Patrick Heron shot, but they have gone on to create some really extraordinary exhibitions in this space. And this is just a few to let you see the way they've been able and the scale that the gallery allows them to work in, which is really huge. Um, really been exciting to watch. As an architect, it's been one of the great pleasures is watching the way the curators in St. Ives have just responded to the space and the way artists have responded to the space. Now, because we felt it was important that the gallery was um, a continuous journey with the top floor of the existing gallery um, and the galleries were sunken, we ended up with a surface at about the level, just a bit below the top of the town with these roof lights. We began to think how we could use this um, new public, this new space as a public space and not just uh, fence it off. And this is some sketching of the way you might inhabit the space between and around the roof lights and some sketching. And then the way you might come down between the roof lights. And it's, it was a kind of gift from the Tate back to the town. This is a view across the site from a cemetery next door, and then moving the, the kind of pathways between the roof lights with the, uh, yep, and the way the townsfolk use it to go down to the beach. Uh, and then the only really built element is a pavilion which sits, which holds offices and uh, curatorial spaces, as well as a loading bay. And it sits above the ground and it was very important that we gave it a materiality that was very much about St. Ives. These are glazed tiles. Um, we chose a, a, a yellow tile and then we ha had hand painted a series of glazes in blue and green. This is a photograph of it in the sunlight. They're tilted slightly up towards the sky. And it's been really wonderful seeing the way that these um, change during the day. So this is a view from the pavilion across the roof lights to the sea. This is the color that we thought we, they would always be, this sort of bluey green, yellow. Um, and it mostly keeps that color of a kind of green, yellow. But what's extraordinary is as the sky changes, because they're tilted slightly towards the sky, they change color completely. So they almost go a, a purpley yellow at, uh, at dusk. And then uh, they even pick up elements of purple, which we never could believe come up um, in twilight. And then in the evening, they go a very dark blue. But first thing in the morning, they catch the morning sun and they're almost a sort of bright sunshine yellow. Um, and that's been a really extraordinary thing to think of how that material could be. Um, uh, but uh, the main point of all of this was to create really great art space for the Tate. So I, that's the major project I wanted to share with you today, but I thought I'd just give you a glimpse at our work that we're doing at the National Portrait Gallery in London. Um, 
It's uh, National Portugal was built in 1896. It was built by this um, jolly looking fellow called Ewan Christian. Uh, it's uh, a very handsome building, uh, but it's not one that anyone's really spent much time looking at. It's a uh, Italianate facade. And um, here we have uh, the interior detailing, which is quite handsome as well. So it's a really grand building. We're very fortunate we have all of the original drawings that you and Christian had. And um, so this is a view, a photograph of it when it was first built. I think what's really happened, you can see in this drawing of it, you can see how quiet and pastoral the landscape is around it. But what's happened in the last hundred years yeah, is that the, the context has changed considerably. It's become very crowded and very noisy in this area. So very quickly, this is the existing entrance, which feels like the entrance to a gentleman's club is very excluding. Um, and so this is a plan and very quickly, you can see at the top, the entrance is on the side and it, it goes through a, a staircase. It's a very confined, very small space. And the space in front of the building is a kind of awkward garden space. You can see people sitting on fences. Um, so our project, the main part that I want to share with you today is about taking this and creating a new entrance for the building, facing up the major street, creating, cutting through the ground floor, a new entrance hall, and creating a new public space in front. Uh, and this new forecourt, as it's called, uh, it will have a gentle set of stairs and a very uh, continuous landscape that bring you up and then three new entrances. Uh, and there's a sculpture out front, which will gently shift one side. Um, so this is the facade as it is. And the, what we've negotiated with the city is to take these three windows and cut them open to create a new entrance and to really bring this facade back to life and to create a much more public space. So this is a view of what we're looking to create. And uh, this is the three doors and moving through the new entrance that we will create for the National Puerto Gallery. And um, so the entrance hall that you then arrive in is cut through what were exhibition galleries to create a direct access to the existing hall from Charing Cross Road, which is a very busy street in London. And this is the new entrance hall as we uh, envisioned it. The other aspect of the project, which I'll just touch on lightly, is that there's a, a wing towards the National Gallery and it's been underused. All of the areas that you see are dark, have never been used for the last 60 years. We're opening all that up to create new spaces and new galleries. And in the basement of the building, there's a pretty shabby uh, learning space. And what we've realized is that there were elements built in this area in the 1980s that blocked up what had been a double height courtyard and double height spaces. And we're, we're taking all that away to create a really dynamic new learning center in uh, the MPG. Uh, and that's a view as we hope it will be. And this is that courtyard section and we're removing all these elements and then creating a bridge that crosses it, that takes you to the new entrance and takes you to the spaces. And this is a view in that space. So what I want to do just to finish off is show you a glimpse of some of the construction that's underway. So the spaces that we are just talking about, this is the front courtyard as it was. Um, six months ago, it started to be demolished. Uh, this is a view of the museum director standing in the space as that double height courtyard is being removed. Um, and as it is now, uh, when that's a view where the bridge will be. And the learning center itself, uh, that double height space. We've begun demolishing the structures that were added in the 80s. Uh, and you can start to see that double height space revealed for the first time. And the east wing, uh, just to show you where the area where the shop used to be, has all been stripped back and the floor taken out and uh, all the historic windows revealed and spaces upstairs that had been once galleries used as offices for 60 years 
are now being returned back to being galleries. And finally, the new public space at the front. This is the view that we're looking for. Uh, this is the demolition of that uh, public space, the removing of the railings. The three windows that you see in this image have been cut open uh, to create the three front doors. And this temporary bridge will soon in the new year be replaced by a permanent bridge. And we take this as a cutting through the facade and revealing uh, granite and Portland stone that you'll see as you enter the building. And even keeping the remains of the mullions and transept of the windows. Um, and then this is looking out towards the new forecourt. And finally, uh, the new entry hall, which has had some substantial steels put in to open it up. So that's the new entrance and the final view of the entrance hall that we've created with big steels to create this new public space. Thank you very much. Well, Jamie, thank you for a magnificent uh, tour through um, some fascinating buildings for uh, showing uh, and, and indeed creating art. And it strikes me that one of the things uh, that, that, that sort of uh, ra you raise are the different forms of creative thinking that can come into working for art. On the one hand is the work that you do as an architect, which we might loosely call design. There's then obviously the work that the artists do, creating work, and you talked about creating space for, for living artists like um, Anthony Gormley and Christopher Lebrun. Um, <clears throat> but there's also, of course, curating. And indeed, when you talked about um, uh, St. Ives, you showed that the, the, the uh, curators have actually come up with a plan you hadn't thought of. And I just wonder mm. if you could say a little bit about the difference between working with artists who are creating objects with which they want to put on view in some way and with curators who are trying to create uh, both the spaces in which the work can be seen but also to create relationships between the different works yes i think this is a really important thing that we we learned through these stages of development in a way um i think what is really the when the, when the artists are creating their work, they rarely are thinking about gallery space unless they're being asked to come to a gallery and do a specific installation. They're working within whatever medium they, they choose and they, they're creating a, their body of work. Um, when the curators come to put that work into a gallery, they often find there's a disjunction between the, the scale um, the way the artists want the work to be viewed, the quality of light that work should be viewed, and all of these things that the artists are very specific about, that the curate that the building fails to allow the curators to do. So I, there's often a kind of um, gap between the intention of the artist and the ability of the building to allow the curators to um, achieve what the artist was hoping to have. I think that gap between the artist's intention and what the curators would like to do is often let down by the building. And so what when we came I've, to St. Yeah. So when yeah, we came I, to St. Ives, it was yeah. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Go go on, fin finish this this thought, then we'll have to wrap up. Okay. So when we came to St. Ives, it was very much about creating a building which had an architectural presence itself but at the same time allowed curators this immense flexibility to control daylight, to, um, to build walls where, where, they, where they would be successful. And, and it's, I think that balance is really important. Well, thank you very much. I mean, clearly what you raise is some very interesting thoughts about the way architecture, uh, art and design can all, and curating can all interact. And I think that's a, a good note to finish on. So thank you very much, Jamie. You're very welcome.